second lecture during the week. So we have an event in a row. Uh, on Monday, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Scharf give us a lecture, and today we have Elizabeth Scharf. And uh, before I start, actually, I want to thank our uh, center staff members here, right? Muriel Cost and Zilin here, Jeffrey here, right? Without them setting up everything here, so I can't imagine how we can make this event successful, right? And uh, by the way, my name is Jiang Wu. I'm a director of Center for Buddhist Studies here at the University of Arizona. And on behalf of the center uh, and also Department of East Asian Studies, uh, I want to welcome everybody in the room and also everybody online. And uh, today uh, is our uh, lecture in a uh, lecture series. So we call that Obaku Yingen and uh, uh, Lingyin lecture series, right? So I'm going to read a short paragraph to describe the event we're uh, having for this year. The year 2022 marks the 350th death anniversary of Zen master Yuan Longqi, a Japanese pronunciation is Ingen Ryuki. Special ceremonies and events are held in both China and Japan to honor this great Zen master. In North America, uh, the Center for Buddhist Studies, College of Humanities at the University of Arizona has organized a series of commemorative events which began on March 3rd, 2022, right? This is last year. So we had the uh, ceremony. Uh, These events present and explore the extraordinary life of Zen master Yin Yuan and the great achievements of the Huangbo Chan tradition known as the Obaku School of Zen Buddhism in Japan that Yin Yuan pioneered in China and Japan. These events highlight the intersection between religion, art, and the culture in China and Japan. Activities include an online exhibition of works or art related to the Obaku tradition. Right? So the website is ingen.arizona.edu. Uh, also includes academic lectures, music performance, and the tea-related events. This lecture series is made possible thanks to the generous support from One Fu Temple in Fujian, Fujian, China, Lingyin Temple in Hangzhou, and Matcha.com. For more information about our lecture series, please visit our website at cbs.arizona.edu. Right. Okay, so uh, now I want to turn to our online audience because we have a co-host system here. So I'm the host for this room. And also we have Dr. Robert Gordon, who is the co-host for our online portion. Uh, Dr. Robert Gordon is right now a assistant research professor at our Freedom Center. And he just published a book about a Buddhist architecture in America. Yeah, so congratulations, Robert. Uh, do we want to say a few words on behalf of our online audience to welcome our uh, guests and also our speaker? Right, thank you, uh, Dr. Wu. Uh, welcome to uh, Elizabeth Sharf, Dr. Sharf. And as, a, as an art historian myself, I'm, uh, I'm just actually very excited to hear your talk. Uh, for those of us online, you know, I will be monitoring the chat. If you have any questions, please feel free to uh, put them in the chat. And afterwards, we will uh, convey them to the speaker. We'll go back and forth one question from the uh, in-person audience and then one question from the online audience, please is what we normally do. Uh, and so feel free to uh, put any comments in the chat and I'd be more than happy to help you out. Uh, but thank you, and John, uh, it's, uh, I'll be here and uh, thank you for having me. Great, thank you, Robert. So now please allow me to introduce our uh, distinguished speaker today, Elizabeth Horton Scharf. Uh, Elizabeth Scharf has a PhD in Asian art history from the University of Michigan and is interested in East Asia Buddhist portraiture. Her dissertation features paintings of Obaku Zen abbots. She is also co-editor with Robert Scharf of Leading Images, Japanese Buddhist Icons in Context. She is also helping right now curate a online exhibition celebrating the 350th death anniversary of Obaku Zen founder Yingen Ryuki's uh, 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 the Yuan Longqi, right, in Chinese, 
organized by the Center for Buddhist Studies at the University of Arizona. Today, uh, her talk, the topic of her talk is how to read Ingen's portraits. Right. Without further ado, please join me. Welcome, Dr. Elizabeth Schroff. Thank you very much, Dr. Wu. I am so happy and excited to be here. Um, we were supposed to be here in November, but it didn't happen. So finally we're here. It's Tucson, Arizona. It's beautiful. It's windy, <laughs> but it's gorgeous. Um, I want to begin by thanking Dr. Wu for initiating this whole project, celebrating Ingen on the 350th anniversary of his death and also for inviting me to be a part of the online exhibition committee. Uh, it's been very enjoyable and, and wonderful. And I just wanna have a shout out to Patricia Graham and Dr. Patricia Graham and Dr. John Johnston, with whom I've been really working hard on the exhibition for on, on, online. Um, I have a lot of slides to show, so I'm, going, I'm not going to give any historical background. I assume you all know now that Ingen, is the Japanese name of Yinyuan Langqi, who was born in South China in 1592 um, and died in Japan 350 years ago in 1673. After founding a new school of Zen there, now known as Obaku, which flourished in Japan in his lifetime, peaked in the 18th century with over a thousand temples and remains strong today with well over 400 temples. Portraits of Ingen were sculpted, painted, and printed. So many were made in his lifetime and after he died that we can actually trace changes in how he was perceived, especially as he aged and grew in stature in Japan. This is owing largely to the depiction of the face. But I won't be focusing on the depictions of the face today. I'd rather focus on the settings because they are also instructive uh, for how the portraits were originally read. Um, and so um, I will, though, spend time at the end, if there is time, to show you close-ups of the faces in chronological order. So you can see that in Japan, Ingen actually gets younger as he grows older. <laughs> so, um, and in this lecture, I'm going to divide the images, the portraits of Ingen, into formal and informal formats. And as we will see, the formal portraits instruct us about the role of the Obaku abbot as abbot, and the informal portraits are more relaxed and connect us to Ingen as an individual. Great. So let's start with the most formal of all the formats, the so-called chair format, and begin by considering the portrait subject, the Zen abbot. A brief review is in order. The central duty of all Zen masters is to sustain the spiritual lineage to which they belong by transmitting the Dharma, briefly the Buddha's own mind or awakening, from master to disciple. To receive the Dharma is to become a Dharma heir. Dharma heirs are eligible to become abbots, and it is predominantly abbots who are honored by having their portraits made. Furthermore, those who receive the Dharma become patriarchs of the lineage. Some patriarchs are historical figures, others are legendary. In ritual contexts, abbots are living patriarchs around whom resolves the ritual life of the monastery. How did artists solve the problem of how to paint an abbot's portrait? Perhaps the celebrated medieval portraits of Zen abbots surviving in Japan have led us to think the master seated in a chair, we think of that as the classic resolution, and indeed this is a good starting point. The depiction on the left of the venerable Chinese master Wu Jin Shifan, painted in China and brought to Japan in 1241, is an excellent example. Wu Jin is seated cross-legged on the carved wooden chair, having removed his shoes and left them neatly arranged on the matching footstool. The graceful rounded chair is draped with a sumptuous silk textile, which cushions it and deflects breezes from the rear. The abbot is comfortable, but his posture signals alertness. He holds a stick in his right hand, called literally an admonishing stick, 
used in the monastery for discipline and to keep disciples alert during meditation. It functions here as an emblem of his rank. Wujun's awkwardly, Wujun's awkwardly drawn left hand rests empty on his legs. His surplice, a garment that was traditionally stitched together by Buddhist monks from patches of reused rough cloth reflecting their asceticism, is here made of precious silk. The overly large gilt metal ring holding the surplice in place adds to this fairly ostentatious display of status. When we compare the Wujun to the early modern portrait of Ingen, on the right, a sense of continuity with the earlier painting emerges. Here, too, is a display of authority, stature, and command. Like Wujun, Ingen is costumed in ample layers of silk robes topped by the surplus and precious ring clasp. He also holds implements symbolic of his patriarchal power, the gnarled wood staff, the traditional walking stick of a Buddhist monk, and the white-haired fly whisk, an implement with a long history in India and China. The staff and fly whisk appear most often in Obaku portraits. Less often, we see the scepter and rarely the stick that Wu Jun holds. The two paintings are noticeably different, however, in look or feel. Unlike Wu Jun, who is shoeless, cross-legged, and turned away from our gaze, Ingen's legs are pendant. He wears his shoes and adopts a wide, stable stance, fully facing the viewer. The bright colors of his costume contrast with the subdued, earthy tones of Wujun's, and the method for shading the face differs. The Ingen looks more westernized and may reflect a new influence from European pictures introduced by Jesuits in China in the 17th century. That's another a hot issue, but I'm not going into that now. But they do remain remarkably similar. Beginning in medieval China, robes with sleeves came to replace the large. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you haven't been looking at this. Um, just as to, to sum up, the, the Wujun is not a frontal on Fas pose. It's the 13th century portrait on the left. Um, it, that's the biggest difference with the Ingen on the right. Um, the colors are different. The subdued earth tones of the medieval portrait on the left are really different from the bright colored surplus, for example, uh, in the Ingen on the right. Uh, and if you were to look closely at the faces, which I'm not spending so much time on, um, you would see they're both done with realistic, naturalistic means. Um, but the Ingen may have an edge, may look more westernized, uh, owing perhaps to uh, European pictorial methods uh, introduced in China in the 17th century. But in spite of these differences, they remain remarkably similar. Beginning in medieval China, robes with sleeves came to replace the large and unwieldy square piece of cloth originally used for the inner robe. So they both wear robes with sleeves. You can see the differently colored under robes peeking out at the wrist and neck openings of both portraits. The surplus remains square and made of patches, but new and expensive cloth comes into use. And this change leads to the use of rings of precious stones and metals to secure the robe, which otherwise might fall open in an indecorous manner if you simply tied, tried to drape it or tie it. Note that both abbots also have autographed their portraits. We will return to this critical feature later. But the most obvious thing they share is the composition. Note that both abbots are seated in chairs. Like the objects the abbots hold, the chair itself is an implement with functional origins and symbolic overtones. It lifts the subject off the dusty ground where the dangers of snakes and insects lurk. It literally elevates the subject, and not unlike a king on a throne is an expression of status. Moreover, there is an absence of setting. There are two ways of understanding the blank ground. One, the setting is readily understood to be an altar in the interior of the Dharma hall and doesn't need to be, nor could it easily be depicted. Or, or and, or, the blank ground is also used for depictions of Buddhist icons, deities abstracted from context, who themselves stand or sit on elevated platforms. Such painted depictions recall sculptural ones. The choice of the black gr blank ground here identifies the portrait subject as a deity of sorts. To explore this further, let's look at the layout of the monastery of Mampuguji 
Obaku Zen's headquarters, and then at its Dharma Hall and focus on the chair portrait paintings. So in medieval China and Japan, formal portraits of deceased abbots were needed for funerals and commemorative rituals. They were displayed permanently or temporarily in various locations in the monastery. Most notable locations were the Founders Hall, Patriarchs Hall, the Dharma Hall, and the abbot's quarters. For example, in the course of an abbot's funeral, the portrait would be moved around a lot. It was first set up in the Dharma Hall, then moved to the grave site, and then to the abbot's quarters, and then to a resting place in the Patriarch's Hall, from which it could be retrieved for periodic display in memorial rites of the calendar year. So I have circled uh, in the center, uh, you have this two-story structure, that's the Buddha Hall on the left, and behind it is the Dharma Hall, and it's flanked by, um, by the abbot's quarters, which traditionally are be behind the Dharma Hall, but at Mampukaji, they're doubled and they're on either side. There's an Eastern and a Western. And the patriarchs and the founders' halls are, are off access. And you just see the uh, fa facade of the founders' hall on the right. Let's see. Okay. We'll use this one. To fully understand the context for the chair portrait, we need to look inside the Dharma Hall and turn to the ceremony known as Ascending the Hall, where the abbot takes a high seat to preach the Dharma. In this most formal rite, the abbot ascends a fixed faint frame chair that has been placed on the altar in the center of the Dharma Hall, and from there delivers a short mannered sermon, meant to be that of the Buddha, to an assembly of monks and lay followers, and may engage members in debate. The origins of the rite are in medieval China, but it was still performed in Ingen's day. Zhang Wu has written about numerous specific performances of the rite by Ingen and his teacher, Feiyin, Heiyin in Japanese, where the use of the fly whisk as an emblem of Dharma transmission is also featured. The abbot thus enacts the role of the Buddha in the context of the ritual. Just as the Dharma hall is aligned on the main axis of the temple with the Buddha hall, the abbot on the high seat in the Dharma Hall is aligned with the Buddha icon on its altar in the Buddha Hall, and the two become equivalent in the context of this ritual. The chair portrait alludes to this formal rite. The ritual context is understood, and the blank ground needs no explanation. The artist places the subject in his most iconic official role as enlightened master and Buddha equivalent, preaching the Dharma from the high seat on the altar of the Dharma Hall. The three-quarter view has a long history in East Asian portraiture, but it's fun to think that Wu Jun's disciples entering the Dharma Hall for the ascending the hall rite would have had precisely the view of the abbot that is captured in the portrait. In contrast, the frontal on fast pose of Ingen's chair portrait marks a noticeable shift in the appearance of Zen abbot chair portraits. The obaku formula of the strict frontal pose heightens what was already in place in the medieval period. The abbot portrait already functioned as the holy icon. This pose is usually reserved for Buddhist deities, such as you see in the Shakyamuni image on the right. Other conventions that one may recognize as associated with religious icons involve the way the abbot's robes drape over the high seat, the attention given the positioning of the hands, and the implements held recall attributes held by Buddhist deities. Both medieval and early modern portraits reaffirm the continued presence of the enlightened patriarch at the monastery and act as surrogates for the deceased or absent abbot. The chair portrait formula from Ingen's day continued in the 20th century. The abbot Jiko on the right died about 50 years ago, 300 years after Ingen, and still we see the chair, port in all its chair portrait in all its recognizable features. And Dr. Johnston tells me that there are still portraitists working for all the Zen schools in Japan today. That is the same painter's work for the different schools to meet the considerable demand for abbot portraits by temples and among the laity. Just as the Ingen looks more westernized than the Wujun in terms of the facial depiction, reflecting the influx of European pictures, so the 20th century Mampukuji abbot, known as Jiko, the 55th, 
abbot of Mampukuji, looks more modern than the ingan, not only, by the way, in terms of the eyeglasses, because although Port already portrayed in paintings, eyeglass, oh, wait a minute, rarely portrayed in paintings, eyeglasses were in use in Ingen's day, but in terms of the photograph used for the head. Note that the hands are still painted like Ingen's. The contrast of face and robe, always notable in Obaku portrait paintings, is here heightened by the insertion of a photograph of the head into a largely unchained chair portrait, unchanged chair portrait formula. The Jiko portrait is inscribed by his successor at Mampukuji, Zenryo, the 56th abbot, who uses the eulogy to include the biographical detail that Jiko served as Mampukuji's abbot for six years. Since Jiko served during the last six years of his life and didn't autograph this portrait, I wonder if this portrait was created in 1973 for his funeral ceremony and subsequent commemorative rites. In any case, this reaffirms that the age-old mortuary context for portrait making is still significant. In sum, the chair portrait is perhaps the most impressive of all formats in the way it displays the portrait's subject. Here we find abundant robes topped by the stole or surplice, draped over the left shoulder and held fast by a ring and clasp. Implements such as lacquered batons, ivory-handled fly whisks, and gnarled wood staffs confidently wielded, Erect postures and comfortable chairs with footstools. Now let's turn to chair portraits in sculpted form. Let's compare an Ingen portrait to a medieval one. The medieval sculpture of the famous unconventional Japanese Zen master, Ikkyu Sojin, on the left was commissioned in 1481, the year of his death, by a consortium of his disciples. Ikkyu sits costumed in his finest robes on a wooden chair adorned with a silken cloth. He holds the stick, and his empty hand possibly once held a fly whisk. EQ's own hair was originally implanted in the work to enliven it with the deceased spirit. It has now largely fallen out. The Ingen portrait on the right was completed in 1663, the 11th month, 27th day, according to a record in Ingen's collected poems. This means that Ingen was alive when this was made. Indeed, he lived another 10 years. Like the EQ, and a consortium of disciples commissioned the portrait sculpture, and his Dharma heir, Sokuhi, or Jifei, names the sculptor the celebrated Hando Se of the Arhat sculptures at Mampukuji. Sokuhi records that the sculpture was conceived after learning that it was Ingen's wish to retire, which he subsequently did in 1664, the next year. The disciples felt it was time to undertake a major commission. By Ingen's day, the practice of making a portrait of a living abbot was well established and had a name, longevity image, especially when an abbot was considered considering a career transition, either retirement or moving to the abbacy of another temple. Ingen also sits on a wooden chair and once held a fly whisk, the handle in one hand, the hairs in the other. It is missing here, but in some photos, the sculpture is holding an antique fly whisk in the right hand. The polish or high gloss of the face is owing to its being washed every morning as part of the daily care given the work. Ingen's surviving robe tells us that this sculpture was made to his size. Often, his, his surviving robe tells us that this sculpture was made to his size. Often, such, such sculptures, sculptures are slightly less than life size. Sculpted portraits were expensive to produce, and so fewer were made and fewer are extant. The use of real human hair, life-size dimensions, and the realistic, uncompromising depiction of an aged face remind us that in the prehistory of these sculptures are highly visceral sculptures of ancient and medieval Chinese monks, including mummies. Some famous ones, such as the dry lac lacquer sculpture of the 8th century abbot Ganjing, come to mind, but there are many others. The sculpted portraits call to mind the living abbot on the high seat in the Dharma Hall, just like the paintings but in appearance and function, unlike the paintings, the degree to which there is continuity from Ikus to Ingen's day, from the medieval to the early modern period, is quite uncanny. You may wonder why I'm comparing medieval works of art to Obaku works. The short answer is that the Obaku portrait paintings were marginalized in the modern period because they looked so different from medieval works. They were formulaic in appearance, too brightly colored, 
and the facial shading sometimes was too much. And they were thought to have little religious purpose, at least compared to modern, romanticized notions of the medieval portrait as a cherished gift from master to disciple and a certificate of enlightenment. I like to demonstrate that they are entirely in the same tradition in spite of their outward appearance. And in fact, the sculpted portraits are actually not at all that different in terms of aesthetic and religious values. As well, unlike the paintings, the setting is not absent. The sculpted portrait of Ikkyu resides in perpetuity in the abbot's quarters of Shuon An in, in Kyoto Prefecture. Here it is with offerings placed before it on the altar. Through these offerings, Ikkyu's spirit is both nourished and propitiated. Like Chinese ancestor spirits, spirits of the patriarchs are believed to be present long after their physical death, and so they require care, offerings of sutras, chanting, food, light, music, and incense to ensure continued prosperity of the monastery. The sculpted portrait of Ingen resides in perpetuity in the Founders Hall, the Kaizan Do at Mampukuji. The photograph on the left is from an exhibition held at the Kyushu Prefectural Museum in 2011. This was a rare instance of the sculpture of Ingen being put on public display. The view on the right is from the recent Kaizan Shiki, or Founders Rite, performed last year in the Founders Hall at Mampukuji for the 350th anniversary of Ingen's death. Ingen's portrait is concealed behind the altar curtains. Ample offerings are also placed before him and offered up in the course of the rite. Note that Ingen wears an elaborate headdress, as does the current living abbot on the right. It's hard to see. Note that when the Ingen sculpture is displayed wearing the headdress, he is also made to hold a fly whisk. These accessories were owned by Ingen. We respond with almost the same sensitivity to the sculpted Ingen as we do to Ingen's belongings, still preserved and revered as relics of the master at Mampukuji. Dr. Johnston sent me the photo on the left of a recent Ingen memorial procession, which shows the current abbot wearing the tall headdress. Now let's turn to another classic formula or format for depicting a Zen abbot, the half figure portrait. The half figure or half length formula, it has also been called an extended bust portrait, is also known from the medieval period. On the left is Mokoan Shuyu, not to be confused with the later Obaku Zen abbot Mokoan, a disciple of the famous 14th century Japanese prelate Muso Sosaki. A, a famous half figure portrait of Muso depicts the abbot in three quarter view, but facing in the opposite direction from Mokoan. You see that at the top in the middle. Recall that in medieval Zen monasteries, portraits were preserved in sets in patriarch halls to bolster genealogical claims. When they were taken out for memorial services and set up in Dharma halls to serve as focal points for offerings and prayers, they helped secure a sense of legitimacy and even lay patronage for the monastery. The half figure format was initially required for these sets. When displayed, they were arrayed to the left and right of a central image of Shakyamuni such that some portrait subjects face left and others right, depending on their number in the lineage. This is a design consideration that the Obaku formula foregoes by choosing the frontal pose. Other differences of medieval versus Obaku include the different palettes, the former subdued and earthy, the latter bright and colorful. Also in the medieval portrait, the implements held in the hand are omitted. Notably, in the Ingen half-figure image, the robes, the regalia of office, and the formal frontal pose is virtually the same as in the Ingen chair portrait. On the left, we have a portrait of Ingen from around the year 1692. It is the central scroll of a triptych preserved in the temple Kofukuji in Nagasaki. It was most likely created to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Ingen's birth in 1592. It certainly looks celebratory. The buoyant, almost joyful gold circles on Ingen's robe allow the viewer to read this portrait from a distance. Note that in terms of costume and accoutrements, like the portrait we just saw, 
Ingen looks like he just stood up from the high seat. A friend of mine browsing the internet stumbled on this very portrait or perhaps a copy in use in a memorial service held at a museum exhibition, as you see on the right. As with the modern portrait of Chico we just saw, the contemporary use of portraits in the Obaku fold deserves far more, far more attention. Today, paintings are preserved in temple museums or treasure halls, but still may be taken out for monthly or annual rites. But there's more work that needs to be done on this. Notice the offerings, ample just like the sculptures, but unlike the sculptures which receive daily care, the portraits receive such care only when displayed. Now let's consider the numbers of surviving Abbott portrait paintings. For this, we need to focus on the inscriptions. This is an image, that's okay. It's just an image of Ingen at age 80. Okay, that's great. Okay, portrait inscriptions are called eulogies. Eulogies are written appreciations of the person portrayed. Eulogies are mortuary in connotation. Early examples often contain the biography of the deceased portrait subject. Many eulogies record the name of the person who commissioned the portrait or requested an inscription. Zen abbots often were asked to inscribe portraits of themselves. We call these self-eulogies or autograph eulogies. The abbot is autographing his own image, akin to celebrities signing their photographs today. But the Zen abbot does more than the contemporary celebrity. He also composes a kind of admonition or teaching, at times mocking the opportunity to write an appreciation of himself. The eulogy here is a self-eulogy. Ingen records that he is 80 years old. He would die two years later. We will return to this eulogy at the end of the talk. For now, simply note that it refers to the biographical detail of his emigration to Japan. The phrase, the sacred mulberry, is a translation of Fuso, a common metaphorical reference to Japan, and even references his half figure. The eulogy on this portrait of Ingen was written by his most senior disciple, Mokuan. It was brushed on this portrait about three years after Ingen's death. Yet unlike Ingen's self-eulogy, there is no biographical detail. Rather, Mokoan is employing a familiar play on words long used for portrait eulogies of Zen abbots. True image, or I'll say the Japanese Shinso, is a compound of the Chinese characters for truth and image. In its everyday sense, the compound simply means portrait. The first character, Shin in Japanese, Chen in Chinese, was one of several terms for portraits in use since the medieval period in China, reflecting the assumption that a true image of a person must exhibit a certain degree of fidelity to reality. That fidelity makes it true. The portraitist tries to make the portrait subject recognizable, to capture a likeness. Yet in the Zen tradition, and this is not only Obaku, but the Zen tradition in general, the term gave monks the opportunity to highlight the conundrum of creating something that captures the full reality of a person, including his spiritual being, and something so material as a portrait. Although the portrait captures something of Ingen's physical likeness, his white hair, his face full of wrinkles, and even his sentience, as Mokoan writes in the eulogy, quote, this portrait is not true. His form cannot be seen as form. In other words, this portrait is not a portrait. As Griff Folk and Robert Scharf have explained, the true image of the master should not be sought in his form, but rather in the formless Buddha nature itself. Okay, you want to help me advance this? Try that. Yeah. Okay. Evidence from documents such as the recorded sayings of eminent Obaku monks suggests that a great number of abbot portraits were painted. So evidence from documents such as the recorded sayings suggests that a great number of portraits were painted. 
These recorded sayings texts, which literally record the words of the master, include lists of verse inscriptions the master brushed on portrait paintings, either of himself or of others. And so these can be counted, and the number can be compared to the number of extant paintings. By Ingen's day, Chan and Zen masters had been composing inscriptions for their portraits for a very long time. Medieval recording sa recorded sayings texts record hundreds of eulogies, sometimes for a single abbot, suggesting that many portraits were painted. Yet only a tiny fraction survive. There are around 70 that are recognized as national treasures or important cultural properties in Japan. Several hundred years later, when we look at how many self-eulogies are preserved in the recorded sayings of Ingen and his top two prominent disciples, Mokuan and Sokuhi, we find that there are likewise many more eulogies recorded than there are surviving paintings. Add to this the fact that eulogies were often reused, and this tells us that many more paintings were made than are recorded. In fact, many Obaku portrait paintings actually do survive and are still coming to light. According to the survey by Nishigori Ryosuke in the 1980s of three major Obaku portraitists, some 250 paintings executed before the end of the first decade of the 18th century are extant, of which about one quarter or around 65 paintings depict Ingen. It is not unusual to come across an unpublished portrait of Ingen or of one of his disciples. Furthermore, when we look at how many temples converted to the Obaku fold in the course of the first 100 years in Japan, by the year 1745, over 1,000, we can appreciate the pressing need for images of Ingen as founder and his Dharma heirs as abbots. These would be used for lineage displays, annual memorial services, and funerals. That individual monks and lay disciples would desire a portrait of their teacher so that they could also carry out commemorative rites especially around the death anniversary, also seems likely. Portrait painting workshops would have come into being to meet the high demand through a process of copying and sharing drawings and the like. For example, let's take the case of Toran, the third abbot of Fukusaiji in Nagasaki. The three paintings above are three different portraits of Toran, and he autographed them all. He is recognizable in all three as the same person. The painting on the right was inscribed with an autograph eulogy by Toran in 1695. It is especially sumptuous. Unlike many Obaku Abbott portrait paintings, this one is on silk and very large, 163 by 79 centimeters. It is preserved in Fukusaiji, where the portrait subject was Abbott. I won't discuss the one on the left, which I only know from a catalog, but will simply note that it seems identical to the one in the center, except for the inscriptions, which are different. Let's focus on the central painting, a visually rich portrait, also on silk, but a bit smaller, at 106 by 47 centimeters. It has recently come to light. The autograph eulogy reads, Predestined to be born in the country of Min, which is Fujian, in China, I lived in Mulberry Heaven, this is Japan. Silent, silent, without one word, the bell seemed to sound. Twenty years ago, I traversed the vast sea. With my long staff, I examined snakes and dragons, which may be a reference to monks under him. Toran came to Japan from China's Fujian province in 1673, coincidentally the year of Ingen's death. Like Ingen, he refers to this momentous life event in his autograph eulogy. Toran was invited to Japan by the abbot Jigaku of Fukusaiji and Nagasaki, and in 1688 he succeeded Jigaku as abbot. From this eulogy, we can guess that Toran autographed this portrait around 1693. If I'm not badly mistaken, he would continue as, as abbot until his death at age 67 in 1707. When I photographed the silk painting of Toran on the right in the 1980s in Japan, at Fukusaiji, I was very moved. Fukusaiji had been destroyed in the atomic bombing of Nagasaki, but I was in an entirely rebuilt modern structure. Seeing such a lavish portrait painting of its long ago and to me little known abbot was somehow very moving. That's why I was overjoyed to see photographs of the silk painting of Toran on the left when it came to light recently. It is now in our online exhibition. 
and I look forward to seeing it in person. Although they differ in many ways, they share the same formula for the physiognomy of the face. The choice of an ornate throne and floral textile, the jade ring and the standard implements, and the use of strong colors on a silk ground. They both achieve a most beautiful embellishment of the standard obaku chair portrait format. Peonies and clouds set against a dark blue ground frame the monk's head. Somehow in the midst of repeating a standard formula of the chair portrait, the artist has achieved something very touching. Here are details from the painting at Fukusaiji. Obviously, the care that went into the creation of these paintings reflects the esteem felt for the portrait subject. It also conveys his own inner strength and vibrancy. So now we have two things, inscriptions and embellishing uh, the chair and the silk uh, thrown over the chair um, that are trying to loosen up uh, the chair format uh, so that it's not so rigid and so that um, it can be a little bit more pointing to the actual portrait subject and not just the portrait subject in his role as abbot. This is our last format uh, in terms of the formal portraits. So I wanna just address it briefly. These are um, albums of patriarchs. Albums of patriarchs are portable treasuries of spiritual lineages employing what we call the bust portrait, a head and shoulders shot, so to speak. Such painted albums have woodblock printed cousins. I'm not including printed portraits in this talk, but it's a rich area for study. So today I'll only show you images from one album of patriarchs. This painting of Ingen is attributed to an artist named Yang Daozhen, whose portraits of Ingen are among the earliest extant, such that we think of the artist as working solely in the obaku fold. Poems were written to him by Ingen and Mokoan, for example, in gratitude for his work. In any case, in Japan, Ingen had Yang Daozhen add four portraits to an album of patriarchs that he brought with him from China. To get an idea of the album's size, of 130 leaves, 57 survive today. The preface to the album, Breast by Ingen at the Monastery of Fumonji in modern Osaka Prefecture, is dated to the fifth lunar month of 1657 three years after Ingen arrived in Japan. In this album, we have an early depiction connecting Yin Yuan, or Ingen, to his immediate teachers, Miyun and Feiyun, who, are, who all together are celebrated for reviving Zen Buddhist monasteries and reinventing Zen Buddhism in late Ming China. Ingen is regarded as being in the 32nd generation of a lineage going back to Linji, he in the 31st, Mitsu in the 30th. Note that the implements have disappeared in the leaf depicting Ingen, whereas Mitsuun or Miyun holds the gnarled wood staff. Feiyun, his hand is awkward and empty, and Ingen's hands are concealed. Ingen's surplus is knotted, there is no ring clasp. It is as though Ingen has commissioned Yang Daozhen to highlight his own subordinate place in the lineage. As you may have noted already, the abbots are depicted with the long fingernails of the educated elite speaking to their exalted position in society, free from manual labor. The date 1631 is the date that Feiyun received Dharma transmission from Miyun, and 1633, Ingen from Feiyun. So the, the direction of the Dharma transmission is unilinear. The fourth image that Ingen had Yang Daozhen add to the album depicts Bodhidharma, the Indian patriarch who transmitted Zen teachings from India to China when he became the first patriarch of Zen. Ingen is thus linked to Bodhidharma, with whom he had in common the transmission of the Buddha's awakening, or the Dharma, from one nation to another. For Bodhidharma, the transmission was from India to China. For Ingen, the transmission from China to Japan. Let's look briefly at one of several extant Obaku lineage paintings, large groupings of patriarchs in one picture plane. Here, Ingen's spiritual ancestry is traced back in time through all the Chinese patriarchs, featuring Bodhidharma in a red robe, then on through the Indian patriarchs to the seven Buddhas of the past, of whom Shakyamuni is the most recent. He's the one on the left, on the top left, 
of the second row down. We read the painting from the bottom up if we are going back in time. Like albums of patriarchs and lineage paintings, hanging scrolls in sets of three triptychs, or more rarely in sets of five pentatechs, also come to display Ingen's lineage ties. Only one or two surviving triptychs feature Mion in the center, as we see here. Note that the transmission depicted is unilinear, from Mion, Miyun to Feiyun. The higher-ranking disciple is always on the central figure's proper left, which is our right, and then to Ingen on our left. Traditional practice for the display of Chinese ancestor portraits informs the spiritual genealogy practices of Zen schools. Obaku portrait painting is akin visually and in display practices with Chinese ancestor portrait painting. In 11 of the 17 extant triptychs, Ingen appears, as he does here, in a set made in 1668, in the center, flanked by Mokuan and Sokuhi. Mokuan takes a senior position to Ingen's proper left. This triptych marks a transformation in Ingen's persona, from emigrant emigre monk from South China to preeminent founder of a Japan-based lineage. That is, Ingen is promoted in Japan first by a triptych with his Chinese Dharma teachers, and later by the portrayal in triptychs with his top Dharma heirs in Japan. This is a change from a unilinear transmission to one that branches out after Ingen. It is interesting to note, and not surprising owing to the ravages of time, that the number of triptychs increases as the demand for portraits of Ingen virgins with the flourishing of the Chinese emigre mass monastic com com community. Okay. There are also triptychs in the half-figure format. Here is a later triptych, circa 1692. We saw the central scroll earlier. The lineage captured, captured here goes from Ingen to Ingen's Dhar Dharma heir Dokutan on our right to Dokutan's Dharma heir Eppo on the far left. The triptych conveys a genealogical connection wherein Ingen is Eppo's Dharma grandfather. It is the most important personages of a particular time and place who are honored by inclusion in a triptych with Ingen. Recall this is after Ingen's death. But why triptychs? Larger sets of multiple patriarchal paintings were, after all, traditional. Recall that the earliest evidence of Zen portrait traditions concerns the display of sets of half-figure hanging scrolls depicting patriarchs arrayed to the left and right of a central image of Shakyamuni. And, as we have seen, Ingen's community also made use of large albums with multiple leaves depicting individual patriarchs. The Ingen triptych may derive from the patriarchal displays, but more immediately, it echoes a shorthand formula for capturing the Buddha's dissemination of the Dharma that had been in use since the first century CE, the Buddha triad, in which a central figure of the Buddha is flanked by two bodhisattvas, or, as here, by two ancient patriarchs. Recall that the abbot on the high seat in the Dharma Hall is aligned with the Buddha icon on the altar in the Buddha Hall of traditional Zen monasteries, including Mampukuji, where the early patriarchs Mahakashyapa and Ananda, the first ancestors in Ingen's venerable lineage, by the way, flank the Buddha. In a sense, then, this painted triptych of Ingen with his two earliest heirs in Japan alludes to this very sculptural triad. We will now move away from a demand for strict adherence to lineage concerns in the formal portraits toward informal, more relaxed compositions where things start loosening up. I identify two separate categories of informal portrait, the lion and the landscape, but they are not really mutually exclusive, as we will see. On the screen is perhaps the earliest extant depiction of Ingen on a lion, executed in 1657. The other painting is unpublished. I photographed it in the 1980s at a dealer's shop in Kyoto. The lion paintings seem to portray Ingen in the guise of the Bodhisattva Manjushri, whose vehicle is the lion. We will discuss this shortly. The landscape paintings portray Ingen in the guise of a man of letters, comfortably at leisure in the out of doors. This comparison suggests that the lion portraits may also be imagined in an implied outdoor setting with Ingen seated on a lion instead of a rock, 
But it also might be that, in the guise of a bodhisattva, Ingen is yet again depicted against a blank ground, as though the image itself is now a Buddhist icon. Let's take a closer look. Note how in both paintings, Ingen is seated in a relaxed manner, grabs the staff, an emblem of the wandering life of a monk with both hands, and seems to use it to bear the weight of his pose. Although the Nalwood staff is ubiquitous in formal Obaku paintings, it makes more sense in the informal paintings, owing to its practical function as an aid to traversing a landscape on foot. An even closer look highlights the similarities, especially in the way the figure grasps the staff in two hands, something you never see in a formal portrait, and looks straight out at the viewer, as Ingen is wont to do in almost all his portraits. These examples remind us that we are still not far from the formality of the Buddha triad, even out of doors or in, oops, I guess, yeah. yes. So these two examples remind us that we're not far from the triad. Even out of doors or in supernatural settings, Ingen and his top two disciples, Mokoan and Sokuhi, assume their ancestral positions and hint at the Dharma transmission that underscores their authority. And note that the Ingen seated on a rock on the left again holds the flywisk, a symbol of leadership, transmission, and teaching or discourse, and wears shoes in ways that recall the formal portraits. Yet these lion and landscape compositions lack the conventions of formality that we saw in the chair, half figure, and album leaf for portraits. Let's explore the lion imagery further. Ingen's robes in chair portraits, respectably secured, now fall loosely open at his chest. The surplus is gone, replaced by a loose shawl covering both shoulders. Ingen is barefoot, and we also see his bare wrists and forearms. And although the head still faces front, it is turned just ever so slightly to the right. The body is now in three-quarter view. And most noticeably, a lion is majestically depicted in bright greens and blues with a giant head and bulging eyes. How can we understand this surprisingly novel portrait imagery? At least 11 early images of Ingen seated on a lion are extant in Japan. While many more images are known from records to have been made in China and Japan, during Ingen's life, although they are now lost. In fact, some extant images seem to be numbered 33, 34, as though many were originally made. Although a few images of other Obaku abbots portrayed on a lion are known, the number is so small that it seems the formula was so closely associated with Ingen that it died with him. Let's briefly explore the most obvious option for explaining this imagery that Ingen is adopting the guise of Manjushri. The allusion to Manjushri, generically identified as the Bodhisattva of wisdom in Mahayana Buddhism, seems visually obvious. Here's one Manjushri on the left from an early album of Obaku Patriarchs, and another on the right from an Obaku triptych that I will also show the whole triptych next. Note the bare feet, the leisurely fall of the robes, the squishiness of the lions, and the relaxed pose in all three images. There is a sense of humility in both the Ingen and the Manjushris, an almost, almost languid presence. It seems to be obvious that the formula of Ingen atop a lion derives at least in appearance, if not in meaning and function, from the Zen-style image of a more down-to-earth Manjushri seated on a resting lion. Now, uh, as an aside, Manjushri plays, plays a host of roles in China, including several specific to the Zen school, but I won't go into that now. Here is a Buddha triad preserved at Mampukaji in the form of a triptych of three hanging scrolls, with Manjushri atop a reclining lion and Samantabhadra atop an elephant. This particular humanized version of Manjushri and Samantabhadra developed in the UN period in China, so in the medieval period, when celestial bodhisattvas were, for the first time, depicted seated on animal mounts, lying on their bellies, that is, the mounts aren't standing on all fours, as opposed to standing on all fours. Note that the Manjushri holds a ceremonial Nyoi scepter, an implement associated with abbot regalia, and occupies the senior ancestral position in the triad to the proper left of the central figure of the Buddha. Note also that there is an atmospheric landscape quality to the setting, 
with the halos akin to full moons and clouds buoying up the Buddha. The problem is that if Ingen is identified with Manjushri in the lion portraits, he no longer occupies the central ancestral position of the Buddha. Ryonan Genso, an Obaku nun artist, resolved this problem by putting Ingen in the center on a lion, with Mokuan in the Manjushri position. This must be an early triptych, judging from the younger faces of the monks, and each monk autographed his own portrait. Um, by the way, this uh, is from the research of Patricia Fister, and I will be looking into this more. But for now, uh, simply note that this novel composition is found by this Obaku nun artist, Ryonan Genso. When I asked Dr. Johnson to inquire about this when he was in residence at Manjushri last fall, the answer came back that the reference of Ingen on the lion is not to Manjushri at all, but to the Buddha via the concept of the lion's roar or the Buddha's teaching. Here you might be able to see it better in uh, black and white. I'm trying to get better photographs. In any case, let's look at more lion portraits. These slightly later versions by another artist in the Obaku fold follow the early format. But note that the whisk and the white-soled red shoes are back, except for the version in the center, where Ingen is barefoot and the whisk hangs from his wrist. In spite of the informality of the bare toes, open robe, and a relaxed pose, however, there is also a bit of arrogance here, captured not only in the fierce lion's head, but also in the eulogy, which boasts of straddling a lion and towering over sentient beings. The tone is more in keeping with an allusion to a Buddha than a bodhisattva, perhaps. It reads roughly, faith and yet no words, solitary dominion and yet no anger, Straddling a lion, towering majestically over sentient beings, bearing his authority and brandishing his staff to his end. What can heaven make of it? There is another suggestion for interpreting the lion portraits that may be important, um, and this leads us to the landscape portraits. It has been suggested that the lion portrayals might be connected to a remote subtemple of the Chinese Mount Wangwa called Lion's Cliff. This is the counterpart temple to Mampukuji, the ancestor temple, where Ingen spent six years in residence and later commemorated in eight poems. As Zhang Wu so eloquently writes, before Ingen arrived, Lion Cliff was an abandoned cloister. It was not within the vicinity of Mount Wangwa, but was surrounded by mountains. There was no road leading to Lion Cliff. Ingen and his disciples had to build and pave trails. The cliff was often shrouded in mists and the clouds frequently flowing below his hut. Above, one can see the summit of the mountain high up and hear the sound of flowing water in creeks. To the south were thick woods and birds could be heard all the time. Yin Yuan firmly believed that as a Zen monk, the mountains surrounding him had their own lives. He felt that he was part of the mountains and the mountains had been internalized within himself. When one of his disciples asked who was living in the mountain, Yin Yuan immediately stood up. These painted lineage portraits in a landscape, which are the ones in the middle and uh, on the left, do not purport to depict the actual lion cliff, but they do place him in the natural world and highlight its critical importance to him. And some think that soon after he emerged from this retreat on lion cliff to return to the main te temple, he had the first lion portrait made. The landscape on the left is peopled with Ingen's lineage, from the Shakyamuni triad at the top to Ingen in formal wear with staff and fly whisk near the bottom. The landscape on the right is the most beautiful extant portable triad of Ingen with Mokoan and Sokuhi, his top disciples in Japan. It has a Mokoan eulogy and may reflect Mokoan's own affinity with the natural world. It evokes a Chinese man of leisure enjoying nature's beauty. When we move closer in, it is very interesting to note that the Ingen on the left looks like a mini formal chair portrait transposed to the mountainside, a portrait found in an anecdotal context. In the real world, Ingen would probably never sit on a rock in full regalia, 
but it didn't matter to the artist telling the story of his lineage. The Ingen on the right is far more integrated into the landscape. That is, it looks more natural for Ingen to be sitting there. This is owing to the change of robes, which now fall loosely open at the belly. Like the other formats, there is a classical medieval prototype for the Zen master seated or standing in a landscape setting. On the left is a celebrated portrayal of the Tang Dynasty Chinese Zen master Deng Shan crossing a stream. This is the legendary moment of his enlightenment, where he sees his reflection on the surface of the water. Note that the staff is handy for crossing streams and wandering in the mountains and appears frequently in portraits of Ingen as the classic monastic implement. On the right is a celebrated medieval Japanese prelate, Daido Ichii, who is seated with staff and visited by animals. You can see a deer and a heron before him to left and right. There are images of Ingen with deer and heron as well. Also, it is interesting to note that according to Zhang Wu's study, from a young age, Ingen had a strong connection to animals, as seen in his lifelong practice of freeing them. In any case, in brief, these symbolic images of the Zen master in the natural world inform the portraits of Ingen in a landscape. And here is a modern sculpture of Ingen standing, akin to a landscape portrait painting of Ingen that Zhang Wu recently discovered. Note this shared implements, the staff and rosary. This modern sculpture is displayed outdoors on the grounds of Nagasaki's Kofukuchi Temple. The implication is that Ingen, the Zen master and Chinese sage, is best understood as a traveler in the natural world. As I mentioned, the landscape setting also recalls literati culture, for celebrated persons among the Chinese elite were often depicted in a landscape, and the obaku monks were closely associated with the Confucian elite. As Zhang Wu writes, Ingen was largely self-educated but came from a family with solid scholarly connections, and he was a prolific poet himself. Zen monks had to be able to write poems, letters, and in general have the same knowledge as members of the educated class. So it is natural to depict them in a landscape, long a profound symbol of the deepest knowledge and highest aspirations of the classic Chinese sage. In the middle, a Chinese scholar stands with staff in an implied outdoor setting. The artist who painted this figure is Zen Jing, a famous portraitist who also painted a now lost portrait of Miyun, Ingen's Dharma grandfather. And the earliest extant portrait of an Obaku monk, Ingen's Dharma master, Fei Yin, is also painted by a follower of Zen Jing. It's extant at Manpukuji. Obaku portraitists in Japan are regarded as followers of the Southern Chinese School of Portraiture associated with Zen Jing. And I'm showing you details of the Mokuan and Sokuhi from the portable landscape triad that we just saw. To fully appreciate the Southern Portraiture School features, the sensitive shading and the care going in to each hair depicted, etc. In any case, we know from Ingen's poetry that he loved the natural world. As Zhang Wu tells us, he even identified with Mount Fuji, the sacred volcano in Japan, which he passed on his way to Edo for the shogunal audience in 1658 and regretted not climbing. In 1663, he had a mini Mount Fuji constructed on the grounds of Mampukuji, for which, for which he wrote this poignant poem. Us both with white hair and me old besides, facing each other, we think the same thought. I would say something deep, but have nothing to say. I'm relying on you to keep this going forever. I would like to let Ingen have the last word. With staff in hand, I reach the land of the sacred mulberry, there gaining a head as white of, as frost and snow. Yet with eyes as perfectly clear and pure as the Dharma realm, my revealed half figure all the more glowing, I expound the meaning of Shakyamuni's holding up the flower and awaken my descendants to the place of the great dream. May this hang forever in the pine hall, together with pine and bamboo, and the teachings endure on earth as long as heaven reigns. Self-eulogy by the old monk, Yin Yan, age 80, on the 15th day of the new year, 1671. And this is Ingen's foot, not Manjushri's. And I, I don't know, what time is it? Should I just go through the facial depiction? Is it five already? Oh, then we'll, uh, that's, okay. Just to, I just wanted to, I don't have anything to say, but that um, it's so fascinating 
um, to look at how Ingen's face changes over time. These are different portraitists. And I'll also be showing you uh, the Fein, the early Fein. Well, so here's the Zhenjing from 1621. This is the grandfather of the school of portraiture to which all Obaku portraitists belong. Here's the Fein by a uh, Zhenjing follower, Zhang Qi, uh, dated uh, in the eulogy to 1642 and extant. And there's the Fein on the left. And this portrait of Ingen is our earliest, uh, and it's 1657, our earliest chair portrait. Note how old he looks in a way. And there's actually one little earlier chair on the left, two very different, but these are both Ingen, a year apart, probably two different portraitists. And here you can see the Fein, the depiction of the face, that portrait style, though techniques are carried into the lion and the, and the album of Patriarch's portraits of Ingen as well. Here's the three different portraits of Ingen on a lion by the same Obaku portraitist. And here we have Ingen younger on the left, older on the right. You can see his hair is getting white. And uh, here about contemporary, but one is a chair portrait and one is a landscape. And here we start to get unusual changes with a portraitist called Kita Genki, who did the work on the right. And perhaps his father, who did the work on the left. So in between the years 1668 and 1671, to me and to a lot of people, it looks like Ingen is actually getting younger as he gets older. And he's certainly gaining in stature in Japan. And uh, and strength of character, uh, his uh, perceived as someone strong and virile. And here's another comparison, a posthumous portrait of Ingen on the right. And this uh, very early portrait on the left, and yet another uh, uh, portrait by that, uh, the one that did the 1671 Kita Genki. Um, this work on the right is... Uh, it's very viscerally in your face in terms of the shading. And just quickly, Mokoan and Sokuhi facial depictions. Um, this is Mokoan, a uh, chair portrait depiction, and one from the landscape portrait of the 1660s. These are about roughly the same time. Mokoan is young. Same thing with uh, uh, Sokuhi. A uh, chair portrait on the left, and then the landscape portrait on the right. And these two from the lion, lion triad. And that, this is the end. <laughs> That's Ingen. Thank you.